Hey, good morning, Creek. How are you? Um, I miss you guys doing Easter online. That's a, that's a first for us. I uh, hope your family is well and safe. Uh, I think the older I get, um, the more I appreciate the Apostle Paul. Uh, an opportunity yesterday for really the first time as you know, I'm mending from, from a surgery. Uh, I went out to my farm, and walked around, and um, prayed for you guys and prayed for our church. Uh, and I think as he, you know, wrote to that church in Thessalonica, those Thessalonians, how he wanted to be um, in, in their presence in the flesh. Uh, his desire was to be, to be with him um, or with them. And, you know, the present circumstances didn't allow him to be there uh, with, with that church in Thessalonica. Um, I, I'm, I'm the same way, man. I, 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 I miss you guys um, and long to be with you. Uh, and in your presence. And so today was a good, or yesterday was a really good day for me um, as, you know, I prayed for you and prayed prayed for the church. And man, this is, this is Easter, man. It's the time that we get to preach Christ uh, crucified. Uh, and regardless of the circumstances, what that what we may be facing with COVID-19 and uh, not, not meeting in, in the flesh. Uh, Paul, Paul wrote to, to the Philippians that his desire was that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. And regardless of what we face, uh, again, everything that we're going through uh, didn't surprise God. Um, we can bank on the power of the resurrection. Uh, and what an incredible promise that is. Um, and so, uh, this Easter, first for me, not meeting with all of you, first for me in I don't know how long, um, I'm not going to be speaking. Um, our, our brother, Justin Bailey, uh, is going to bring us to the foot of, of the cross today. So enjoy um, worship with your family right now uh, and enjoy um the power of the rex resurrection on this Easter Sunday. Uh, and I do want y'all to know that uh, Cheryl, Cheryl and I love you.
Well, good morning and happy Easter to you, my brothers and sisters at the Creek. It's a joy to get to bring God's word to you on this, uh, the best of all days, Easter Sunday. And most of the time, uh, we rush to get through the darkness of the crucifixion to get to Easter. But my guess is that this Easter, many of us are probably struggling to feel Easter hope. Because though Jesus is out of his tomb, we are being told to stay in our caves, uh, unsure of how long this season of sheltering will last. And yet perhaps it's appropriate that now we come to the joy and the hope of Easter uh, to feel it all the more powerfully. Because as Jesus rises, so too our hearts rise with him. So this morning, I'd like to start with a story that captures a bit of what it means to experience the surprise of Easter in the midst of grief and loss and sadness. So I'll give you a chance to turn to John chapter 11, John the 11th chapter. I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen here as I read the passage for us out of the ESV. Will you follow as I read? Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister said to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, O oh Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. But for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. So let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days, and Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. 
But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. So in this passage, we find two strong believers, Mary and Martha, who encounter a loss that leads them to say to Jesus, if you had been here, this would not have happened. And that statement gets repeated twice, first by Martha, then by Mary. If you had been here, our brother had not have died. The words are full of sadness and disappointed expectations because implicitly they're asking, where were you, Jesus? Why didn't you show up? Why didn't you prevent this? We should not, of course, restrict the experience of grief to the loss of loved ones because we grieve over many things, over fractured relationships and frustrated hopes, broken dreams, even the thousand smaller losses of this season. There's already been a wedding that I was supposed to stand up in a couple of weeks ago that I was not able to go to. It's those small things, missed graduations, missed uh, birthday celebrations, these small defeats that we grieve over. And during this season, when even the possibility is that people will lose their lives, we maybe wonder why God doesn't seem to show up in the way that we expect. Why does it seem like Jesus sometimes waits to ask, to act? Now, we meet on the first day of every week because of this Sunday. And we meet on the best of all Sundays, Easter Sunday, to remember that there is hope for our disappointed and wounded hearts. A Savior who not only understands our wounds, but who has himself been wounded for our transgressions. And this text offers us a Savior who walks with us, who weeps with us, but who also works for us until the very end. And so in the time we have together today, I want to invite you to meet him in this text and in faith. Because as we take in this climactic miracle this morning, we are invited to watch Jesus as he waits, and then as he weeps, and finally as he works as he reveals himself to be the resurrection and the life. So these are the three movements of the sermon today. Jesus waits, Jesus weeps, Jesus works. Let's take them one at a time. First, Jesus waits. This brings confusion when Jesus waits. Now, chapter 10, which has immediately preceded this chapter, ends with a dramatic scene. The Feast, of Ta- the Feast of Dedication, Jesus makes the scandalous claim. He says, I and the Father are one. The Jewish leaders take this as blasphemy, and so they pick up stones to kill him, and Jesus escapes the mob and withdraws to the other side of the Jordan a few days' journey away. Now, given the hostility towards Jesus in Judea, it makes sense that he would lay low for a while. But something happens to immediately draw his attention back towards Judea. Because in the town of Bethany, a mere two miles from Jerusalem, live three of Jesus' closest friends, Martha and Mary and Lazarus. These three were followers, disciples of Jesus. They believed in him as Messiah. They supported his ministry financially. And Jesus receives a word now that Lazarus is sick. 
So the question becomes, will Jesus return to Judea where there is a credible threat to his life? The disciples are clearly confused that Jesus would have any idea or inclination to go back to Judea at all. They don't understand why he would take the risk. They say to him, these people were just seeking to stone you, and now you're going to go there again? If Lazarus is asleep, that's good for Lazarus. And if Lazarus is dead, well, what can we do? To go back to Judea now that Lazarus is dead is basically to choose to die with him. But this text complicates things even further. We are told in verse 5 that Jesus loves this family, but instead, and we expect it to say that because Jesus loves them, therefore he made haste to go and heal Lazarus. But instead it says Jesus loved them, and so he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. The Greek construction clearly conveys that the delay is motivated by Jesus' love. Jesus loves them, so he waits. So he stays. Jesus waits. And while he waits, Lazarus dies. So that by the time that Jesus finally shows up, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Why does Jesus wait? This brings confusion. And we see this confusion in the statement that both sisters make to Jesus. First Martha in verse 21, and then Mary in verse 32. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here. Think about that statement for a second. Simultaneously expresses confidence in Jesus' power to heal and disappointment that the longed-for healing did not occur. The sisters show a faith mingled with sadness, but not overthrown by it. In the sadness, they cling to the hope of a better future. As Martha says to Jesus, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day later. Yet if Martha expresses correct doctrine, Mary simply speaks what she feels. All we hear is her emotion and her sadness. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, none of this would have happened. My guess is that many of you have experienced loss like the one in this text. And even if you haven't, Martha and Mary's sadness is the sadness of the human race living in a broken world. If you had been here, where were you, God, when life fell apart? Where were you when our hopes were dashed? Because if you had been here, none of this would have happened. Our brothers, and our sisters, and our mothers, and our fathers, and our children would not have died if you had been here. Where were you? Where are you? It's encouraging to me that Scripture does not start by just giving us answers. It also gives voice to our questions. It gives us portraits of faithful believers like Mary and Martha saying to Jesus, where were you, God? Where were you? Because if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Scripture acknowledges our tension, our confusion, without completely resolving it. But we are not left in confusion. We are told some significant things to help us in our confusion. First, we are told that Jesus loves Lazarus and Martha and Mary. So his delay is not a reflection of him not loving them. In fact, it's just the opposite. Second, we are told in verse 4 that Jesus says that it's for God's glory, that God will be glorified through this. In other words, Jesus is going to reveal himself more fully and more clearly because of this grief, because of this loss, because of this disappointment. Let's hold on to this word, this word glory, because it's an important word and we'll come back to it in a moment. But for now, we need to hear Jesus' word to Martha in verses 25 and 26, where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. 
and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? See, Jesus is inviting Martha to move from an abstract belief in resurrection later at the last day, in something that will take place who knows when, to a personal trust in the one who is standing before her right now. He's saying, don't just believe in the resurrection of the dead later. Believe in me now. Trust me now. The object of our faith is not an abstract belief that somehow things could be better. The object of our faith is concrete. The person. Jesus waits, bringing confusion now. But his ultimate aim is to give greater clarity as to who he is, and to demonstrate that he can be trusted. So we should not imagine that Jesus' delay is due to a deficiency in his love. See, he has already revealed himself as a healer, but now he is going to reveal himself as the resurrection and the life. But lest we rush ahead to that miracle, there's one other dimension we need to see first, and it's this, the second point. That Jesus weeps. Jesus weeps. And this brings companionship. Now, Jesus has made it clear, at least to his disciples, that his plan is to wake Lazarus up, to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knows what he's going to do. And yet, as he encounters the deep sadness of the sisters, especially the unqualified anguish of Mary, he responds with the deepest emotion. It says he is deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Someone asked me about this text a few months ago. They said, why was Jesus so upset? And why did he weep if he knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead? And it seems to me that Jesus is actually responsive here to the grief and disappointment that he encounters, even if he knows that he's going to do something about it. See, this passage is one of the most powerful pictures of Jesus' complete identification with our human condition. He weeps with those who weep, even if he knows that he can and will do something about it. He knows our grief is great. Think when we are angry at the brokenness of the world, when we are in the midst of deep sorrow, when we say, I hate this, he is angrier still. When we are sad, he is acquainted with our grief. 2013, I guess this seven years ago now, our family moved to California from Chicago. In April of that year, my wife's sister lost a two-year battle with brain cancer. And during that two-year battle, my wife was frequently traveling to be with her sister, and she was with her when she died. Can I ever look at this text the same way again? I can't speak to my wife's grief. That's her story to tell. But I can tell you how powerless I felt to do anything to make it better. I mean, my work is words, writing and teaching and preaching but words have never felt so inadequate. All I could offer her was my presence and my tears. And then we moved to California. And it was strange to be so far away from our home and so far away from anyone who knew what we had been through, the grief of the past two years. And then one Sunday we went into a church And they sang this song based on Lamentations 3 that went like this. Flesh will fail, bones will break, thieves will steal, the earth will shake, night will fall, flowers fade, the Lord will give and take away. But because of his great love, we are not overcome. And we wept for the rest of that service. And we knew that we had found our church home. But these tears were not just tears of loss. They were tears of deep companionship. Tears from, born from knowing that even in this new place, that God was still with us, present in the joys and concerns of his people. 
And that community, that church, which the creek is a place just like this, became a space for us to encounter the presence of Jesus, who we found to be with us and for us in the face of all that life can give and all that death can take away. Now, there's so much that happens in the world and in our lives for which we have no easy explanation. But even though we don't know the reason for our pain, we know what the reason isn't. It's not that Jesus doesn't care. It's not that God is somehow remote or unengaged. How do we know that? Because Jesus wept. And maybe one of the best things we can say about our loss and grief and disappointment is this little verse, John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. Jesus weeps at the death of Lazarus. He is deeply moved at the pain of the sisters. He is outraged at the pain of the world. You can be sure that he will do something about it. But before he does, he enters into our pain and sits with us and he weeps. For surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Jesus weeps and this brings companionship. But that's not all that Jesus does. Because our last movement is that Jesus works. And this brings confrontation. Now here we have in view both the narrow work that Jesus is going to do at Lazarus' tomb and the broader work that Jesus is going to do as he moves to the cross. So in the narrow view, Jesus doesn't prevent Lazarus from dying because he is going to reveal himself in a deeper way. He's going to draw out a deeper confidence from his disciples and a deeper opposition from his enemies. In raising Lazarus, he is giving us a clearer picture of himself and he confronts us with a choice. Will we trust him? Now, it's one thing to trust God with a preventative faith. In other words, to ask God to keep bad things from happening, to keep us safe, to keep us free from trouble. It's okay to do that. But it's another thing to trust God with restorative faith, to ask God to fix the things that are wrong, to restore us to health, to mend our brokenness, to restore us from the strange time of exile. But it is another thing entirely to trust God with resurrection faith and to believe that on the other side of tragedy, after life has fallen apart, after the dream has died, that God has the power to raise the dead. That despair and defeat and death are not the end of the story. Can we believe this? Because in the broader view, everything that Jesus does in the book of John is aimed at showing us his glory so that we will trust him. We hear his question, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? See, the, ra the raising of Lazarus from the dead is the first domino that falls along the path to the passion. It triggers the plot to kill Jesus that will lead to his betrayal, that will lead to his arrest, that will lead to his crucifixion, that will lead to his resurrection. And this will be the moment when he shows his greatest glory. See, Jesus doesn't just go back to Judea to identify with the human condition. He goes to do the work that will reveal himself the most fully, where death will do all that it can, where death will exhaust itself on him on Good Friday, when he will die. But when death is finished, when death has done all that it can do, he rises. And he is risen indeed. You see, what we have in John chapter 11 is the story of the world in miniature. Imagine that this story of Lazarus, the story of suffering and death, of weeping and waiting, but ending in resurrection, is stretched out not just over a few days, but over a few thousands of years, and you have the story of humanity. But if you stop at the suffering that is confusing, you haven't gone far enough in the story. And if you go a little bit further, but stop where Jesus is weeping, you've gone further, but you haven't gone far enough. He does weep, but that's not all he does. 
the story isn't over again because the story isn't over until Jesus does his work and raises the dead. The Easter story is the best of all stories, supremely because it is true. Because it offers not just a glimpse of joy, but its fulfillment. It offers a God who understands our wounds, who weeps with us, but who offers us his own wounds as healing for our wounds. And the invitation of the gospel is to look at him, to see his glory, and to trust him to walk with him, taking up our own crosses to follow. The call to take up a cross and follow Jesus is the call to a kind of death. But it is also a call to a new kind of life. He calls us, like Lazarus, to come forth from our tombs and to live in light of the resurrection. So if you belong to Christ today, May the hope of the resurrection resound in your heart and remind you of what's real. That you are called to walk in the newness of life. He is risen. And if you're listening to this and you are struggling to entrust yourself to this God who reaches out to you, May the message of the resurrection challenge you to hope and to wonder and to consider Christ. If anyone could have been raised from the dead, wouldn't it be him? May you see him in the gospel. May you hear him in the songs and the prayers. Our testimony that he is risen and that he shows up in our lives, and that in a world in which everything else can be shaken, we testify that though every other man be found a liar, he would still be found true. Wherever you are, I proclaim to you today that in a world full of reasons for despair, that he is risen. I proclaim to you who live in the valley of the shadow of death that he is risen. I proclaim to you who aren't sure if you can go on that he is risen. We are witnesses of this. He is risen indeed. Amen.